Okay, so just to continue my analysis of British Prime Ministers, uh, we have got up to number four, and that was Thomas Pelham Halls, the Duke of Newcastle, to be precise, the first Duke of Newcastle. Um, he was also, incidentally, the first Duke of Newcastle under Lyon. I didn't realise that until right now, in fact. Um, in Britain, there's more than one Newcastle. Now, I should say, in the 18th century, and, well, in the 19th century as well, often political figures were named after the peerage to which they ascended, which wasn't their personal name. So, for example, Thomas Pelham Halls is not generally known to history as Thomas Pelham Halls, the way we would say Blair or Macmillan and so on. Uh, he's simply known as the Duke of Newcastle. Uh, and by extension simply Newcastle, less Newcastle at, and so on. Um, the same would apply to people like the Earl of Derby, the Earl of Aberdeen later on, and so on, just to clarify that point. Now, um, Newcastle was the elder brother of Henry Pelham, who had preceded him as Prime Minister. And a little bit of background information about his grace, the Duke of Newcastle, to give him his formal title of the time. Um, he was born in London and in 1693, when he assumed high office, he was 50, 61, 61 years old. Um, and he had quite an eventful term, two terms I should say. His first term of office was from 1754 to 1756. His second term of office was from 1757 to 1762. Um, and there was a brief intermission by the Duke of Devonshire. Now, um, by all accounts, Newcastle seems to have been a canny political operator uh, and a skilled statesman. And I'm going to give you some facts about him. Um, George II had bad relations with the Duke, and during one altercation, George's poor English made Newcastle think he had challenged him to a duel. This is the king we're talking about. In 1717, the Duke was given the responsibility of overseeing theatres and suppressing any plays or playwrights believed to be too critical of the Hanoverian succession or the Whig government. The Duke of Newcastle was the first Prime Minister to spend his entire parliamentary career in the House of Lords, having taken a seat shortly after his 21st birthday, which uh, was not unusual at that time, I might add. Um, there were several noble events during his two terms in office, in foreign affairs. Um, one of them was the Seven Years War. Um, another one was the War of the Austrian Succession. Uh, well, actually, I should say that was before the Seven Years War. But the Seven Years War was a very important event during the Newcastle Premiership. And by all accounts at the time, it was effectively a world war because it was spread over several continents and involved all the great powers of Europe. Um, However, it was because of the Seven Years' War that Newcastle had to step down after his first term. He was widely blamed for Britain's poor start to the war, and in November 1756 he was replaced by the Duke of Devonshire. Um, some were even calling for his execution from the loss of Menorca in 1756. Um, now, his second term... Uh, seemed to be a little bit more successful. There was a string of British victories in the conflict, and 1759 was known as the Annus Mirabilis, after Britain enjoyed victories in several continents as well as at sea. Um, so that would be considered, I think, um, foreign policy success for Newcastle. Um, he also developed a system earlier on, uh, which was known as the... Bear with me. It was known as Newcastle's system. Uh, I'm reading directly here from Wikipedia, so just bear with me on this. In Newcastle's system, this is a little introduction. Following the peace, this was following the um, seven, uh, sorry, the War of the Austrian Succession. Newcastle began to put in practice a policy had been developing for a very long time. He believed that this stately quadrille, which had seen states continuing the shifting alliances, had been unstable and led to repeated wars. He instead wanted to use vigorous diplomacy to create a lasting peace built around a strong and stable British alliance with Austria. Like many Whigs, he saw maintaining a Euro the European balance of power as essential. He described this process as restoring the old system, 
but was popularly known as Newcastle System. Um, however, he came under continuous attack from Pitt the Elder and the Patriot Wakes, who despised his European policy, pointing to their belief that the previous war had shown that increasingly North America was the most important theatre of war. This would refer to the French and Indian War as theatre of the War of the Austrian Succession. They mocked Newcastle for his perceived lack of vision, ignoring the complex nature of European politics and Britain's relationship with Hanover and the fact that as early as 1740, Newcastle had been aware of the expanding power of the Aust American colonies. I should say also in domestic upheaval, Newcastle played an important role. During the Jacobite Rising of 1745, um, there was allegations that he had fled to the continent, and apparently he had to actually appear outside Newcastle House in London to prove that he was still there. Um, so Newcastle was a very important political figure throughout the mid 18th century. Um, historical retrospect, he probably wouldn't rank as a great Prime Minister. Nevertheless, I think he deserves a little bit more credit than he is sometimes given. He was in power for seven years and my interpretation is that he seemed to be quite uh, able statesman, certainly in terms of diplomacy and his focus on getting the balance of power in Europe to a sort of equilibrium in the interest of bringing about peace surely deserves some credit. Um, and this is the final little piece of information on the 10 Downing Street website. His influence declined from 1760 with the accession of George III who wanted him removed. His final year as Prime Minister saw parliamentary battles over the financing of the war in Europe leading to his resignation in 1762. In his later years, he served as Lord Privy Seal in the Marquess of Rockingham's ministry, but it was a short-lived appointment. The Duke of Newcastle was said not to be a great man, but he was industrious and energetic, and to his credit, he twice refused a pension. Records show that he finally left off £300,000 poorer than he entered it. He died in November 1768 in Lincoln's Inn Fields in London. Um, he was 75. Um, so an important political, political figure of the mid-18th century, um, the older brother of Thomas Pelham who had succeeded him, and uh, sorry, Henry Pelham who, who had succeeded him, um, and that's some details about the Duke of Newcastle, our fourth Prime Minister.